The Trail, Chapter 13. I'm outside, feeding handfuls of dog biscuits to Moose, when Sean and Denver come down the trail. I say hello, and they go inside to have lunch. Moose and I head to the lake, where I avoid families of hikers and find a deserted patch of shore. I skip stones over the calm water while Moose snuffles around the reeds. When I run out of smooth, flat stones, I sit on the rocky shore and think about the last time I had felt this peaceful by the, the water. It was the day Lucas and I had officially gone about tackling the list. It was only a week after the fateful pancake breakfast. Lucas's dad had strapped the family canoe to the top of the Subaru, and we had driven us to Lake Winnipesaukee. We'd caught four wriggling trout. Lucas's dad had scaled and gutted the fish on the picnic table at our campsite. After throwing the scraps to the birds, Lucas and I had rolled the fish in breadcrumbs, and his dad had pan-fried them in a cr to a crisp golden hue over a roaring campfire. That night, we had feasted on fresh-caught fish, and as we sat by the lake, digesting our meal and watching the stars glitter across the, cl the clear night sky, Lucas had pulled out the list and made one long slash across go fishing. One down, nine to go, he said. We had whooped and high-fived our greasy hands. Gah! A sharp prick on the side of my neck brings me out of my daze. I slap at my skin. All right, so this isn't currently happening. The last three paragraphs were in the past. What is that called when an author goes back and forth in time? When I take my hand away, there is a squashed mosquito on my palm, as well as a smear of blood. My neck is starting to itch. I look down and see an army of flies crawling over my pants. Another mosquito lands on my knee and stabs down into my quick, dry pants. It's an interesting phrase. Stabs down. Normally, I think of a mosquito as a bite. I wonder why the author chose stabbing as the verb. Biting insects are the worst of the bad littles. A bat at my pants, and the flies whirl into my face. I accidentally snort up a bug. Ugh, gross. But before I can snort it back out, it bullets through my nose and down into my throat. I try not to think of how many eyes it has. I decide that I'm done with the lake. I stand up. Moose is waiting for me, his long tail thumping against the rocks. I lean over and scratch him behind the ears. Hey, buddy. Moose wiggles his head into his fingers. A stinky pink tongue licks my wrists, and his mouth curls into what I swear is a smile. I give Moose a final scratch and then head back to the hut. Inside, Sean and Denver are refilling their water bladders in a small silver sink. Andy is nowhere in sight. Hey, Tony, Denver greets me. You heading out now? I nod. Just gotta fill up my water bottles and I'll be set. I nervously check the hallway leading to the crew room. If Andy sees me talking to Sean in Denver, he may become suspicious to my story about hiking with my dad. I hurriedly filled my water bottles and shoved them into the side pockets. I sling my pack over my shoulders and nearly fall down. It's a lot heavier than this morning. Let's go. I, I'm impatient to get out of the hut before Andy reappears. Sean immediately heads out the door, but Denver waits until the hut until I've clipped my chest and hip straps closed. I stagger out of the hut behind him. We meet up with Sean and get back on our way. As Denver and Sean stride down the trail, I quickly realize the only reason I could keep up with them before was because my pack had weighed half as much as it does now. Hmm, half as much as it does now. Fractions, invading our fiction. As the trail descends, or goes down, I stumble behind Denver and Sean. My pack straps bite into my shoulders, rubbing them even rawer than before. Every time I lift my foot, it's as if I'm slowing through deep water. I'm silently grateful that we're going down instead of up. But even with gravity on my side, the distance between us grows longer and longer. Every once in a while, Denver glances behind and waits a few seconds. But Sean does not stop nor turn around once. He seems determined to lose me. After a few miles, the trail comes to a whizzing highway up ahead. 
Denver shouts something to Sean, and he finally stops. He turns and glares at me until I've caught up. You're slowing us down, he says sharply. We've got over nine miles to go before Garfield Ridge Shelter, and it's already noon. We want to be able to set up camp before dark, but we won't, with you hanging on us like some sort of parasitic, parasitic tick. Easy, Sean, says Denver. Moose growls. I put my hand on his head to calm him. Sean's words hurt, but he's right. It's been too easy for me to follow them, but I'm not on the trail to be a follower. You guys go ahead. I'll see you at the shelter. Are you sure? Denver asks. Yes, he's sure, says Sean, or Sean says. Come on, D, let's go. He turns his back to me and begins walking fast. Denver looks at me. I nod. Go. I'm going to stop and feed Moose anyway. Denver sighs and hurries after his friend. What do you think that means? Why is he sighing? <sighs> I set down my pack. Moose whines as I dig through my supplies and snaps handful snaps the handful of dog treats I feed him. I polish off a cliff bar as he scarfs down his food, and we're off again. The trail climbs steeply past the highway. I plod along slowly. But I don't stop. Step, breath, step, breath. I chant this in my head as I climb past the tree line and into a boulder field. Step, breath, step, breath. I realize that even at a snail's pace, I'm making better progress on my own than if I had tried to keep up with Sean and Denver. I probably would have pooped out within an hour and needed to rest for another hour. And then I would have felt bad. Now I'm making my own pace. It doesn't feel speedy, but it feels right. The wind picks up. I pull on my windbreaker and cinch up the hood. The sky is sharp and blue, and I can see the mountains all around me. The summer green of the maple leaves. The dark spruce and pine dotting the upper elevations. Valleys on either side of me and a wave of mountains in the distance, stretching all the way to Canada. I look at these mountains and feel the wind pressing into my cheeks, and I close my eyes. A little piece of me opens up to being outside with a dog at my feet and food in my belly. Moose and I fall into a rhythm. He bounds ahead for 30 feet, then circles back to make sure I'm still there. When he reaches me, he wags his tail, gives me a drooly smile, then turns around and leaps forward again. Even though he has far more energy and strength than me, he never goes out of my sight. It's like he's afraid of losing me. It's probably just because he knows I'll give him food. But I don't mind. Like bumps along a camel's back, we hike steadily over peak after peak. Franconia Ridge is made up of a bunch of L-named mountains. Liberty and Little Haystack. Lincoln, and finally, the, be the beast of the range, Lafayette, which stands nearly a mile tall. I suspect this is named after the general from the Revolutionary War, Lafayette. We'll learn more about him later in the year. On top of Liberty, Moose and I happily wolf down a few energy bars. We pass a bunch of folks on the ridge, but I don't talk to them. I'm still trying to keep to myself as to keep myself as forgettable as possible so no one gets suspicious and raises the alarm. By the time we get to Little Haystack, I'm starting to slow down. Moose is running only 20 feet ahead of me instead of 30. On Lincoln, he has stopped running ahead completely. After we have another snack, Moose stays by my side, tiredly panting as we slog forward. As the afternoon turns into evening, the steady stream of hikers trickles to one or two an hour, then none. By the time we reach the top of Lafayette, the sun has set. I pull my map out in the fading twilight and trace the trail to Garfield Ridge Shelter. My heart sinks. I still have four miles to go. It's cold on the rocky peak. A wind whips up and moose shrivers. I look down at him. His head is drooping and his tongue is hanging out. He's tired too. I have to make a decision. Greenleaf Hut is only a mile away. I could go down to it instead of continuing on the trail. It's warm 
and safe. But I said I would see Denver and Sean at the shelter, and that's what I'm going to do. I tell Moose to follow me, and we set off into the growing darkness. Taking the, the tougher path. What would you do if you were tired and the sun was setting? Would you go to Greenleaf, or would you continue on the path? Interesting.